Exodus 15, 19. When Pharaoh's horses with his chariots and horsemen went into the sea, the Lord brought the waters of the sea back over them. But the Israelites walked through the sea on dry ground. Okay, now, um, it, it, if you look at the, the New King James Version, and you'll see this throughout the Bible, it says Israel went on dry land. Well, land is in... Um, Italics, which means it's inserted. So they just walked across dry is the way that it would be described in Hebrew. As I said, Hebrew is more of a pictorial alphabet and a, a language that uh, it, you need to infer things. But um, what God did, remember, just a reminder, he sent what to make the sea part? What was it he did? All night east wind. All night in east wind, that's right. So we can assume that either he just stopped the wind completely or maybe, maybe he made a contrary wind, which actually closed it up quickly, right? Whatever it was, they were on dry land. We have to infer, I don't think it says it here, but we have to infer that the, uh, the, uh, you know, the cloud that went in between Israel and Egypt finally picked up and Egypt said, woo, we're going after them. And uh, they went into the sea and all of a sudden the sea closed in on them. And it was a real quick thing. So maybe... I, I don't know how he did. I'm just getting you to think this through. Is maybe he stopped the wind entirely and the waters just closed, or maybe he sent it a west wind. You know how we get a cold front, and the wind is here, and all of a sudden it switches around within an hour. I mean, really quickly. Who knows how he did it, but the seas closed. And as I said last week, people that deny that this is the Red Sea, they say, well, it was the Sea of Reeds, then the entire Egyptian army drowned in knee-deep water. That didn't happen. In fact, they actually were in a very deep body of water. They all drowned. And first 20. Please. According to, oh, my, yeah. according to my commentary, I was reading on that. It said something to the effect that sometime during the year this happened. They didn't call it, actually call it a miracle. Right. But something to do with change of the weather or something. Right. And you know, that's very similar. As I said, I think it was, I don't remember which sermon it was. I think it was the first sermon I did here back a year ago was uh, the, the Sarasota Bay does that. Does it every year. It, the, the water's just, and we don't call that a miracle, but the miracle is that they were all there waiting. And God says, this is going to happen. See the salvation of the Lord. That is a miracle. And uh, it's the same thing as, uh, you know, any of the other miracles that are natural. Okay, um, I, I don't remember which king. I think it was King Ahaz, or no, uh, no, Jeroboam. One of these kings was going down to fight, and the Lord says, stand still. I'm going to fight for you. And it says that uh, they went into what's called the Valley of Baraha, the enemies, and the Lord just threw stones down on them. Now, does that mean it was an earthquake? Probably the stones just came out of, out of the mountains and fell on the people that are down in the gorge. It's not a miracle that there's an earthquake in the world. It happens all the time. We've had 10 of them in the past two months. The miracle is that the Lord says, this is going to happen. You don't need to do anything. And these people were destroyed. The entire army was destroyed. So that to me, the Lord is sovereign over his creation. That is what's a miracle. And if I went out there, like I said, any day of the week and I said, okay, Hedico, we need to go shopping, and we're going to part this water and walk across and go shopping. I could do that all day, every day, and it would never happen. But if the Lord says, Charlie, I want you to go shopping, and I'm going to make the water dry, that really is him showing his sovereignty over the waters. So, God knew when that was going to happen. That's right. So the commentary that you read is either giving God the credit or it's not, depending on how liberal they are. Some liberal theologians don't want to admit that God really does miracles, and so they give a commentary which says exactly the same thing as another commentary, but they say the Lord did this rather than, well, this was natural. And it all depends on who is writing the commentary. I have no problem with it being a natural phenomena, it, but the natural phenomena came from the mind of God, his wisdom, and at that point in time. And that's what we talked about last night, is how, uh, what was the, the quote I gave? gave a, a guy named, I think it was... Um, Hector Berliotz. Anyway, he said, time is what keeps everything from happening all at once. Mm -hmm. God created time. And this was my quote, which I actually quoted on the internet this morning. If you read the Daily Bible verse, um, uh, time, God time was created by God so he could fellowship with his creatures. That's the purpose for time. If not, we would have existed in the mind of God eternally, but we never would have actually come to be. But he wanted to have a fellowship with us, and so he created this thing called time. And time, as Einstein proved, is 
is co-linked with space and matter. You can't have one without having the other two. He created these things for our benefit and for his glory. So time was created by God so that he could fellowship with his creatures. Otherwise, we would be there just in his mind, but not actually existing. Mm -hmm. So anyway, uh, kind of interesting thoughts on that, but he's the one that created it, and therefore he's in control over it. Right here, proof, Red Sea. Okay, go ahead, Jay. Then Miriam, the prophet, <laughs> Aaron's sister took a tambourine in her hand, and all the women followed her with tambourines and dancing. Miriam sang to them, Sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. He has thrown the horse and its rider into the sea. Okay, okay. this is Miriam, who is, what, the, the sister of Moses. Yeah. Okay, she, uh, I just love the, the symbolism here. This girl is just so excited about what she saw. She grabs a tambourine or a timbrel in this this. I, which I think a timbrel is a tambourine, I don't know. But uh, she just starts dancing and singing, and I can just imagine them going around in a circle the way you see the Jewish people doing this day. They're dancing, and, and uh, they're such, I got to tell you what, they are such happy people. They're such musical people. When we were in Israel, and I think I may have said this in this class before, but you would go through, and I don't mean to put down the Arabs, but most of the Arabs are Muslim, not all of them. There are some Christian Arabs, too. And the Christian Arabs are very happy and musical people, too. You want to see a happy time, go to a baptism of a Christian Arab. There'll be, remember, hundreds of them playing the accordion and singing for the baptism of their people. Or when they have a, uh, a wedding, Rhoda. She's Arab. The girl, Sergio, who was the Jewish guy that plays the piano, and his wife, Rhoda, got married. And as I said, they had... 500 of her family show up for the wedding and two from his family. I, maybe it was three. three. Two came from Russia. One that lived in Israel with him showed up at his wedding. So you can see the contrast. They're just real family type people. But the Jewish people in Israel, when we were up, mom and I were over there, real boring in these Muslim controlled areas. And the people just sit around and they just, they're, they're just lethargic. You get into the Jewish areas and there's flowers on every windowsill. There's people, there's music playing. Everything is clean and tidy. And we went up on the, the above the Sea of Galilee in the mountains on the, uh, the uh, I, I don't know if that's the Golan Heights or not, but that area above the Sea of Galilee and looking down over the Sea of Galilee. And there's a whole group of Jewish girls, kind of reminds me of this right here, and they're playing the guitar. They were singing and dancing and just having... The best time, you never see that in the Arab areas. You wouldn't see it. Now, once again, I want to make a distinction between the Christian Arab and the Muslim area, mm -hmm. but the Ar Muslim Arab areas, I just, unhappy folks. I'm telling you what to It's Israel's fault, right? Oh, yeah, it's all Israel's fault. That's right. That's right. Oh, yeah. Yeah, sure. Oh. And uh, so here we have the uh, Miriam singing. When is another time that a woman or women are called prophetesses in the Bible? Deborah. Deborah, there's another one. She is the judge of Israel. Uh, when Jesus was born when, uh, in the temple. Anna, the daughter of Phanuel. Okay, where's another one? One more time. It's not Esther. No. It's in the New Testament. New Testament. Maybe after the Gospels, but before Romans. Maybe. In the book of Acts. The seven daughters of Sceva. S-C-E-V-A, I believe, are their names. Or is it Philip the Evangelist? Seven daughters of Philip the Evangelist. I said Sceva, it might be uh, Philip. Anyway, we better go there, seeing as I've, I've now proven that I've uh, made a, a knucklehead out of myself. But it is the, um, it, it's uh, probably after he was in Ephesus, and uh, which I, uh, Paul is going back to Jerusalem. And uh, let's see here, Perga Adelia. And it says he stayed in a house. How about 21199? I wouldn't be, yeah, maybe it is that late. I was going to say um, uh, it's going to be, that sounds about right. 21 sounds about right. Go, if you're there, read it. Okay, 219. Okay, on the next day, we who were Paul's companions departed and came to Caesarea and uh, entered. Philip, not Sceva. Um, Sceva is the guy with the sons that. Uh, uh, claimed things in Jesus' name and got beaten up by the, uh, the uh, demon or the, the, the crazy guy. Okay, but Philip the evangelist. So I got one of the two names right. Uh, who was one of the seven and stayed with him. Now this man had four daughters, not seven. He is one of the seven. 
that, so I'm glad we went here because the tape is going, and uh, yeah, so now this man had four daughters who prophesied, okay? So he was, remember the seven that were appointed at the beginning of Acts when they said, we can't wait on tables, we've got to spread the gospel. So they appointed seven people to uh, uh, tend to the widows and the needs of the people. Philip is one of them, and he had four daughters who prophesied. So Deborah and D Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, which is in Luke chapter uh, 3, I believe. And then you have, yes, what were you going to say? Reference. Oh, um, I think it's Luke chapter 3. Let's go no, there. Sing. The, the, the daughters of oh, yeah. Acts 21, no. verse 8 and 9. Yes. Well, yeah. Was it? Okay. yeah. And uh, so we'll go to, I think it's Luke 3. And I'm sorry, you know, I didn't prepare for this, so I should have known all these off the top of my head. I, uh, uh, let's see here. It might be two. Let's see here. Luke, it is. It's going to be... Um, How about two thirty-six? That sounds right. Yes. Now there was one, uh, Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age and lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. So there you go. So we have um, Deborah, Luke... The daughters of uh, Philip, the evangelist, and there may be a couple more. Let me see. I can't think of any right off the top and of my that head. Mean that's all there ever was? Uh, you know, I don't think so, but it's identifying them in this capacity. Yes. But I will say this, that we cannot use any of those as De prescriptive. We can only use them as descriptive. God is describing that these women were uh, yes. Like Deborah, the judge of Israel, doesn't describe that. The, the only other leader of Israel that was a female, anybody know who that was? The wicked queen, Athaliah. Remember, they executed her. Take her out between the, uh, the courtyard, whatever, and execute her. And she says, treason, treason. She's the one that killed the whole royal family, right? Except one baby that was secured away. And that saved the Davidic dynasty, okay? But anyway, that's the only other time. So you can't use that as prescriptive either. Just because there's a bad queen doesn't mean that all queens or all president women or whatever are going to be bad. But as I said, we were talking about this before the class. Is um, And I didn't say this. A, a woman did. I won't say which one. But she said, um, I, I, I'd rather have a male as a president, okay? And I said, I believe that that is the way that our founding fathers identified it. When they speak, they speak of men sp yeah. uh, holding these positions. They never use the term women as a leader. But in addition to that, and this is just my opinion, okay? Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, in addition to that, they were using the biblical model, which is almost always a man. Very, very rarely. Deborah and Athaliah. You get one good one and one bad one. And, you know, Deborah actually, she kind of humbled the guy. What was his name? Uh, Bar uh, Barak, was it? Uh, whatever his name was. He came there and... Uh, I hope so. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so... Um, uh, there you go. Enough of that for now. But, uh, but you know why Golda Meir did a pretty good job? Golda Meir did a fantastic job. She yeah. was selected, you know, obviously by God from yeah, eternity so past, right. and That's she fulfilled right. that position. So we can't dismiss that. Um, yeah. Hey, the Iron Lady herself, Margaret Thatcher. I mean, yes. she, did, she did more than any of these knuckleheads for the past 20-some years have done, right? I mean, they've yeah. just come in, and they've, they've been fired. They've done stupid things. Yeah. She got right in there, and she was... Socialism ever said either. Yeah, you know? I'm, oh, right. And I don't know about Angela Merkel. I don't follow her, but she seems like a pretty tough cookie from what I have seen. Oh, she, Germany. Yeah. So, you know, there are, there are good women leaders, and I'm not trying to make any, no. any comment on that, but the biblical model generally is men. Yeah. Okay, generally. Um, okay, so from that point, let's go ahead and I think if we anybody remembers any other prophet, just, just shout it out during the class because I'd like, like it to be out, but I think those are the only ones. 22? Then Moses led Israel out on from the Red Sea, and they went out to the wilderness of Shur. Shur. <laughs> Shur. They journeyed for three days in the wilderness without finding water. Okay, now think about this. And I, before we read any more, I want you to, to understand. My mom will tell you. I'll let her describe it. What is this entire area like? Oh, it's, traveling through this area is unimaginable. It's a desert wasteland. I, 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 I couldn't walk two hours Without I couldn't walk two hours out into this. Now, these people are leaving a land of abundance. Think of it this way. We're in Florida, and everywhere you go, there's somewhere where you can get a drink of water. Just imagine that we were to start walking 
from the Nile Delta, and we were to uh, suddenly, which is Florida, we're leaving Florida, and all of a sudden, within uh, half a day's journey, we are in the middle of Arizona. And if you've been to Arizona and driven around, nothing. As far as you can see, and there's not a tap of water anywhere. That is what this was like. They went from a place of great abundance to a place of, I, 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 as she said, we can't even describe it. It is so arid and so barren and so rocky and so difficult to travel. And that is what they went through. So I want you to understand that before we read and you say, oh, those stupid Israelites, how could they, when you see they're going to complain, i tell you how they could. Because I would after two hours, not many days. And as I said, they've been in the wilderness and they've already been in this barren place, but their water is running out. How much water can a person carry at one time? They have their animals. They have their, uh, they have their families, their children. They have all of this. You can only carry so much water. And you've got to... With that in mind, let's go ahead and go on. They came to Mara. Yes, which means bitter. But they could not drink the water at Mara because it was bitter. That is why it was named Mara. There you go. Bitter is bitter. Okay. So now you are in this place. You've been wandering around three days. Okay. Actually, more than that because it's three days' journey from the Red Sea. Is that right? So Moses uh, and went into the wilderness three days. So they have already wandered down to the Red Sea and then three days after that. And they come to water. Woohoo! And you can't drink it. And they are, they are beside themselves. And I got to tell you what, you know, if you've ever gone to a place like the Red Sea, it's obviously much more better than this. But if you go to the Red Sea, oh, fun. What a neat place. It's my favorite place in Israel. But if you go there, you are out in, as she said, the most, the most yeah. deserted place I've ever seen on the face of, my, uh, face of the earth in my entire life. And you go out there and there's this beautiful pearl of water out there. And you think... This is it. I can't imagine the first person that went, oh, relief, and he went and dunked his head into that water. Oh, look, it would have killed him. It would have killed him dead. If you get a drop this big of that water in your eye, it is like acid. It is so, it's 20, 23 or 26% solids. Which the, one are you talking the, about? The, the, the Dead Sea. The dead yeah. Oh. So, but that's what I'm saying. But, but what, I'm, no, what I'm doing is I'm saying that this water is bitter like the Dead Sea. That's what I'm saying. So imagine, they get there and they, they're, they're so excited about the water. I'm just making a, a, a comparison well, of the Dead Sea. They the Dead Sea all the time. Yes, they do. But what I'm saying is I these, good, but, what, no, what I'm saying is that these people are in a dry area. They don't have any water and they suddenly see water and they go, Woohoo! So I'm making a comparison of something that I know, which is the, red, the Dead Sea. So if they were to have done this at the Dead Sea, it would have killed them. One drop in your eye is enough to, to bring you to tears. And we had a girl that got a jug of Red Sea water. She, you know, she wanted to take it. Dead. dead Sea. Thank you. She got a jug of Dead Sea water and she wanted to take it back to America. She was on our bus, and she was leaving before us. We were going on to, to Jordan. She was going to Tel Aviv to uh, uh, get on the airplane. So she was there just for the Israel journey. And here she is, not on our bus, the other bus. Here she is on the bus, and, you know, it's real hot in Israel, real arid. So she pulls out a bottle of water, and she pops it, and she, and she threw up all over everything, all over the tour guide, all over the bus. If she didn't, it would have killed her. Now... Thinking on those lines, what I, from my own perspective, me going down to the Dead Sea, and this, it, it looks beautiful, doesn't it? When you're standing above the Dead Sea, you think it's beautiful. But what I'm trying to make is the comparison of somebody walking in the desert and suddenly seeing that body of water that they've needed so desperately and putting their head in there. It, it, it'd kill them. And, you know, it, it just would do it. So the same thing is going on here. Mara is bitter water. We don't know how bitter it is, but it is undrinkable. And these people probably saw the water and they just freaked. Thankfully, we're, we got water. And the first one goes and drinks it and either threw up all over the place or died on the spot. And all the people must have gone, oh. So this bitter is more than a it's, taste. 
Oh, it's undrinkable. Yeah, it, well, I don't know if it's poisonous, but it is undrinkable. It's, it, you know, if it was bitter and they could drink it, they would have drank it. But yeah. this is something they can't drink. It, there, there's just no doubt about it. So, but go ahead, read on. <laughs> Next verse will explain that it wasn't drinkable. The people grumbled to Moses. What are we going to drink? See, it, it tells you right there that they couldn't drink it. It was just, it was undrinkable. And this, where is another time in, uh, uh, where is another time that undrinkable water, let's read this first and then I'll ask you the question. Go ahead. So he cried out to the Lord and the Lord showed him a tree. When he threw it into the water, the water became drinkable. What do you think that tree symbolizes? Wow. What is, why is this story in here? The tree okay. of life. The tree of life, the cross of Jesus Christ. Yeah. That is what this is symbolized. This story is in here just to, to tell us about their misery and about he is specifically making a point. What did Jesus say? Anyone who thirsts, come to me. Come to the waters and you shall have the water of life. And then you get to the book of Revelation and it says, anybody who desires, come. Where is it? Revelation 20. Let me read it to you. It's, uh, if, I don't even know if I have this in my Bible anymore because these pages have all found. There it is. Um, it says here... Um, uh, where is it? Uh, hang on one sec. And the spirit and the bride say, come, and let him who hear say, come, and let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him drink of the water of life freely. So this goes from Isaiah 55, 1, which is on the side of my truck here. Ho, who, everyone who thirsts come. Okay. And then Jesus builds on that in John, I think it's chapter 10, on the day of the Feast of Tabernacles. He says, I am the water of life. Come to me. And then the book of Revelation is the fulfillment of that. Now we have the realization of what he promised. We're never going to lose our salvation. We are eternally saved, but we will still die. We will still get thirsty. Right. Where is one more time that Jesus mentions the water that John chapter, maybe chapter four? Woman at the well. Woman at the well. He says the water of life. So that's a couple times to come right to mind. And I'm sure there's more that I'm not thinking of. But this is the beginning of that picture saying out of Eden, we have this trouble. The four headwaters that branched off and he gives the names of the rivers and they were, you know, obviously it was all drinkable water and it's showing how everything was wonderful in the Garden of Eden. This is our, I don't know if it's the first taste of it. I can't remember because we have a couple other wells that, uh, you know, Abraham and, uh, but I don't know if there was any undrinkable water that's mentioned. But this one is bringing this into context now. God is saying that I can heal the waters. Okay, this is the beginning of that probably. I, and I may be wrong on that. I have to think it through. But anyway, um, he throws a tree in. The tree is a picture of the cross of Christ. Okay, go ahead. He made a statue and ordinance for them at Mar, and he tested them there. He said, if you will carefully obey the Lord your God, do what is right in his eyes, pay attention to his commands, and keep all his statutes, I will not inflict any illness on you. I inflicted on the Egyptians. For I am the Lord who heals you. Okay, the Lord who heals you. That's actually a title that's ascribed to him. Jehovah Rapha, I believe. Um, does it say it here? Does it? Anyway, Rapha, the Lord who heals you. Okay, um, and he says, he's telling them now in advance, if you are going to diligently heed the voice of me, and if you're going to do what is right and all this, then I'm not going to bring these diseases on you. Well, we're going to see in the time of Israel that all of the diseases of Egypt come on the people. All of the punishment because they failed to obey the law that he gives them. But he warns them even before giving them the law. If you will obey me, none of this is going to happen. And even before they get the law, you're going to see before the law is given that people start uh, getting the judgments that he promised. If you will simply obey me. But... Um, later, I believe, and I may, be, no, I'm not even going to bring that up, but what was, oh, what, here's what I, now that we've talked about the water that was healed, where is another time that water is healed in, um, it's probably in the book of 1 Kings, it might be in 2 Kings, one other time that the water is healed. Remember Elisha, the prophet, went down and uh, uh, oh, there was a place, no, 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 there was a place, he went through a series of miracles, what's that? No, that was Naaman the Syrian, and that's one of the miracles, but here it is, it's in uh, 2 Kings chapter 6, probably, it might be 7, hang on here, um, uh, he does, uh, okay, no, that's not the one, what's that? 2 Kings 22, 2 Kings, tw what does that say, what is it referring to? Uh, uh, 
Uh, let's that was probably the uh, tent. It's right in this area. Um, uh, let's see. Or so it happened that people trampled them. Please let the Jordan. We'll see if we can find this real quickly. Will you not show us? Where is that? That's in 22:14. And what was it? Holda, the prophetess. Oh, Holda the prophetess, which is um, in, uh, it mentioned in Isaiah. That's right. Thank you. Holda the prophetess. Uh, let's see here. He's got the axe head that's floating, okay, which is in 2 Kings 6. Naaman the Syrian, which was healed of leprosy, is in uh, 2 Kings 4. Let's see here. The pot of stew uh, purified was back in uh, 2 Kings 4 also. It's right in this area. I'm sure it is. He says, everybody go get a, uh, a, a, hang on, put the pot, the pot of grain. Give me a word to look up. Um, well, probably healed water. waters. Or, he threw water. salt into the water and it healed it. It's the widow's oil. You know, and I had to remember these things, but I'm sorry I don't and so up. Uh, but I'd like you to see it so that you can make a, a comparison. Uh, let's see here. What's that? It's it probably it, what who am I? It probably Elisha is my guess. I could be wrong, but probably Elisha. Let her alone. Her souls um, found a wild lap full of stew. All right, put some of the and he tells them to all get a uh, a branch and they're going to go down to the Jordan and they're going to build a place to live. And uh, where is that? So he went down, dipped in the Jordan seven times. These are Elisha's many. Oh, beam. Here it is. Beam. I came down to the Jordan, the axe head floated, iron float. Um, maybe that's not it. Anyway, it's in here. I apologize for not knowing where it is. You think I'd know this right off the top of my head, and I don't. And I strike the people with blindness. He does a whole bunch of miracles at the same time, and I'm going through them. And the flower, uh, you know, he had the pot of bad stew. He healed that, the four leprous gates. Um, uh, all that was hers. Let me see. We're going to go into... Okay, well, I'm not fine. And it could be Elijah. I always get the two of these guys. Uh, what is a word we can look for? Um, I already asked that. Yeah, I know. I'm trying to think of another one, though. Salt. Let me look up the word I salt. Did, I looked up salt. And it didn't come up? Let me see. Yeah, I'm, not in mine. Okay, well, let me... Not very yeah, well, let me, let me look in this one, and we'll see if we can yeah. find... Because I'd like you all to see this before we go on. Um, S O S I S A S N. Okay, hold on here. What if I find what? What book are you going to find? In probably one or two kings. Probably two kings is my guess, but I could be entirely wrong on that. Um, H I J. Would it be judges? Um, no. I don't think so. No. I don't it think so. Kings or Chronicles. S A. In it, no, it would be in Kings. I don't think it'd be in Chronicles because that's chronicling. Uh, let's see here. Salt. Let me go to uh, 2 Kings. Bring me a new cruise and put salt to waters and cast the salt in there. 2 Kings 2.21. See, I skipped it by one, by one page. <laughs> here it is. Okay, it says here. Um, all right, we're going to go back to, uh, but they urged him till he was ashamed, send them. And they came back to him for he stayed in Jericho. He said to them, did I not say to you, do not go? Oh. Then the men of the city said to Elisha, please notice the situation. The city is pleasant, but as my Lord sees, but the water is bad and the ground barren. And he said, bring me a bowl and put salt in it. So they brought it to him. Then he went out to the source of the water, cast in the salt there and said, thus says the Lord, I have healed this water. From there it shall be no more death or barrenness. So the water remains healed to this day, according to the word of Elisha, which he spoke. Okay, there you go. So I knew it was in there. Apologize for wasting all your time on that, but it's two times in the Bible that the waters are healed apart from Jesus himself. One is with this account, throwing in the tree. What's that? I just, I just, this just doesn't ring a bell with me. I, I try to remember things, but... You know. I know, and you know what? It obviously didn't ring a very big bell with me either because we spent just five minutes looking for it. But anyway, we did find it, two kings, and so you can make a reference in there. And you know what? I bet you, now that I've done this, I'm going to look and they're going to have healed... Look at this. They have it referenced right now. <laughs> I could have saved all that time if I simply looked on this page. Stupid. Okay. Uh, anyway, um, uh, where are we? Uh, he made a statue. Okay. Go ahead. He made a statue. You obey, I will not inflict any illness on you, for I am the Lord who healed. Healed. 
Then they came to England, where there were 12 springs of water and 70 date palms, and they camped there by the waters. The entire Israelite community departed from Elam and came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after they left the land of Egypt. Okay, now let's do something here. Day of the second month. Right, we're going to do something just so you know this. Now first we have, and they journeyed from Elim, where is the uh, palm trees and the, uh, the uh, 12 wells, okay? Now, they can identify this spot. Even today, this, th th that type of geography doesn't change, and so they can know where Elim is, okay? Um, uh, I'm sure I've seen pictures of it, but anyway, this is a place where there are wells, where there's, you know, uh, I wouldn't call it abundant life, but at least it's like an oasis in the desert. All right, and the congregation of the children of Israel came to the wilderness of sin, which is between Elim and Sinai, okay? So they're in between where they're heading on the 15th day of the second month after they departed from the land of Egypt. So here's, when did they depart the land of Egypt? Okay, they're going in. This is the land of Egypt where the Nile flows out into the uh, Gulf, and then this is the Mediterranean Sea, and then they, they go through the wilderness and they get down here. Anyway, they left on the 15th day of the first month, right? Of the first month, because the 14th day is what? The Lord's Passover, that's right. 14th day is the Passover, and they left on the morning. Oh, did they leave? They didn't leave on the Passover. They left on the next day. I, I'm sure of that. Anyway, right. if I'm wrong and you see that, let me know. But I'm sure they left on the 15th. But if they are, I should use the, yeah, I'm going to use the black one. I mean, that does erase, but not nearly as well. Okay, so if they're leaving on the 15th day of the first month, okay, and there's 30 days in each month, and this is the 15th day of the second month, then that's very easy to do. This is day 15. This is um, day 30 plus 15, which is day 45. 30 days they've been out there. You see that? Yeah. Got that? See, they're on the 15th day of the second month. Yeah. And the second month is 30 days long, so 15 plus 30 comes out to 30 days. Or it may be the 31st day. You know what I'm saying? But it's been 30 days. Okay? And that's important because what we're going to get to here in a while is going to... subtracting 15 from 45? Yeah, because they left on the 15th day of the first month. Okay? So you're taking 30 days plus 15 and then subtracting the original 15. And that becomes really, really important later when we get into a couple parallels. But I'm just showing you how this works right now. Okay? Verse 2. The entire... Israelite community grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the pots of meat and ate all the bread we wanted. Instead, you brought us into this wilderness to make this whole assembly die of hunger. Okay, now, this is obviously people lacking faith because they've seen the Lord, they've seen His deliverance. But at the same time, I, I want you to empathize with them. These are people that left pots of meat. They left lots of water. They left, what else did they say? Bread to the full and all that. They left these things, and they are really really dependent right now. I, 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 what I'm trying to say is that although we look back and we say how stupid they were because they saw the Lord's glory, they're tied, we as human beings are tied to our stomachs. I can tell you that if I don't eat and I get really hungry, I get really cranky with Hedico very easily. I, it, that's just the way it is. Somebody else that I know, and I won't say her name, but she's uh, she attends our church, and you know she's a, a recent married girl, and she's very sweet, but she says the same thing. She says, if I'm hungry, I get really snippy with my husband. And so it, we're tied to our, our stomachs, and it changes our mood. It changes our outlook. It's all we can think about. Yes? But that's not the only thing. Oh, I understand. The, these people were dependent. They hadn't been taking care of themselves for centuries. Right. They were dependent on Egypt. They were not... They were not used to providing for them. They sound like a bunch of Americans that are on... Yeah, to, to some extent, that's true. Um, and what do you call it? Unemployment. Unemployment or... Welfare. Unemployment or welfare. Welfare. welfare, yeah. Yeah, that's what these people sound like. Yeah, because they've, they've, they've had they the good life. Have someone else to 
take care of yeah. them, and now it's God. Now it's transferred to Well, even, God. even if that's not the case, let's suppose it's not the case, because they're down in Goshen, and they have their own herds, and they have, you know, yes. they have an abundance. Yes. They are dependent, but let's, let's, let's just assume that they're hardworking, because I, I don't want to think negative about them. But suppose they are still dependent on what's that's coming right. out of the ground. They had to be hardworking. Right. They were slaves. Right. So, but they are dependent on what's coming out of the earth. They're dependent on the, but they're receiving that. Exactly. Just like we do now. Go ahead. Yeah. Isn't it also, when they were living in Egypt, they had a purpose. Like, they knew what the task was. Sure. Day, all of that. It's all like all of us. We have a job. That's a really good point. And now yes. they're wandering to this yes. unknown land. They don't know what they're doing. Where they're going. Do every day. Right. Every day is a new thing. And the Lord is probably giving them just enough information to get them just through like the day. Us. Yeah, well, that's right. We don't just enough information to yeah. get us through the day. And even that we don't have. We're just trusting that the information will come at the end of the day. Yeah. That, that we'll have a bed to sleep in again. Yeah. And so I, I'm just trying to get you to empathize with them. And okay. if this was to happen in America today, just think it through like this. Suppose Wall Street collapses today. And by Friday, every single business in America is completely closed. You go to the Sports Authority, it's closed. Home Depot is closed. Okay, you, we have that mindset because the economy suddenly collapsed and we have, just like we had in the 20s, food lines. People went from normalcy to complete dependence That's on... closer than you think. Oh, I, I think it probably is. I, I, absolutely. So, but just suppose that happens. What is going to be the attitude of the people? It's going to be, that's right. Whoa, it, and what are we going to do if that happens? We are, well, it's, it, but it's going to be a lot worse. But people will do anything to get out of that situation. First, they're going to remember where they came from, which they're doing here, and they will do anything to get out of that situation. If that means giving all of their rights to, to a bad president, they may yeah. do it. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know what's coming. But we have to keep thinking when we're reading this, what were these people feeling? Because we're tied to our emotions, we're tied to our stomachs, and we're tied only to our memory. I, it, literally, that's it. We don't have the future other than the Bible. And so I can see a difference coming up. Just want to tie this in now. I can see a difference coming up in the people that know Jesus and his promises. And I'm talking about Amen. in the Christian context Amen. and the same people in the Christian context that don't. And here's the example. I think I might have given it in this class or maybe the last Saturday class. Is the, the people that attend the Church of Hope. And that's not meant to slam them. They know, okay, it was in this class. Their posts on Facebook week after week after week are completely different than the posts of the people in Grace Baptist Church. They're completely different. Okay, oh, so you didn't hear this. Hope is a kind of a charismatic church. People go in and they get saved, but they don't get developed. Okay, And that's not to say anything bad. That's right. I'm just saying that that is their thing. It's a shallow church. Suncoast is very similar to that. There's a lot it's, of them. Yeah. Whereas, and I always tell people, that, and I went to school with about half that church. I mean, it's amazing how many attend there. But I tell them, when you are ready to develop you'll come to Grace Baptist because this is a discipleship church. It's a church that has deeper sermons. People come in and they're fed the word of God. Okay, there, they are given, it's not Joel Osteen, okay, but they are given much less depth. And so on Sunday afternoon, after their service, I'm telling you the posts are, what a great God I serve. Oh, I'm so uplifted. Thank you, Pastor, whatever, for blah, blah. And, you know, they're very, very happy about it. By Tuesday morning, their posts are, oh, I just, you know, the life yeah. is so bad. And, yeah. you know, whereas in grace, after the church service on Sunday, the, it, you know, people said, thank you, Pastor, whoever. It was a really great message. I learned a lot, you know. And by Wednesday, they're still on that same normal. There's no up or down. It's right. just they're taking life as it comes. And that's a big difference. So I'm saying just in the Christian community, forget the rest of America, yes. there is going to be a giant difference in the, the people. The people here will hopefully say, the Lord ordained this. I'm going to accept it despite the, the troubles. Whereas the people in other churches may not have that same outlook. Ears. Yeah, you know, they, they, they want to be pleased on Sunday morning yeah. and they don't want to get any deeper. You know, a lot of the hope people have come out to the church on the beach and they haven't come anymore. And that's because they actually have to think things through. Right. And that's hard. It's not easy. And I, I said this in the sermon last night. Mom heard it. Art heard it. When I was first presented with these 
first principles, the principles which define logic, I went to bed exhausted. I was utterly exhausted, but I wanted to know, is this real? Okay, so far one person has asked for that sermon and I said to everybody last night, now the people in this class have heard it before, so they know and you all have processed these things, but most of the people out there, I don't know if they want to get that deep or not, but to me that's all I want to do is I want to know God much deeper. I want to know him as deeply as possible so that when those times come, I can say, Lord, Amen. you're directing my steps. So I, and I know we've diverted a lot. But these are important issues, and that's why we study the Bible. And if you just study the Bible looking for prosperity, the Bible doesn't have it. What's that? Oh, you got to go. Ah, oh, Dave. All right. Have a good one. We got through what? The what? The Bible doesn't have it unless you twist it. The what? The Bible doesn't have it unless you twist it. And where it is in there, there is specifically blessing. It's taken completely out of context. That's what you I'm know, saying. yeah. I mean, like spiritual rather than physical. So, yeah. you know, that's it, absolutely. And, you know, has anybody, gosh, I hate to bring this guy up. I hate to even mention his name, but I clicked through the channels and he's not on the Christian channel. You know, which even Benny Hinn is on the Christian channel, which tells me that they need to, they need to get their doctors a little better. But there's a guy that I don't even see on the Christian channel. He's on like channel 11 or 12 as I'm flipping through. His name is Popoff. Has anybody seen him? Yes. I've seen Popoff. him around for a long time. For a long time. I think he is. He speaks very good English, Peter but Popoff. Peter Popoff. Okay, Peter Popoff is a guy that he sells miracle healing water. He sells miracle towels and this kind of stuff. And they had people go into his services and they had one of those receivers and they he had a thing in his ear and yes. somebody up here was saying, go to row number 14, eight seat in, and this person will have a bad heart. Okay, and they, they knew all these things in advance. Well, no, no, get used because to the people filled out forms. That's right, they filled out they forms. And so he, into the service. right, God. and so they had somebody up in the booth directing this. But here's the problem, okay, this is what was happening in his churches. But the problem is after he was exposed, his churches still have four, five, six hundred thousand people. As he travels around doing this, people know that he's a fake and they still do it. And then what does he do? He sits during his show. Just click through the channel and you'll see him and his wife. And they'll be sitting there and she'll have a stack full of, like this thick, stack full of letters. And it'll say, yes, I by faith sent in my money. I got the miracle healing water. I, was, I heard that you would promise that I would receive a, a harvest. And yes, I received $27,000 from nobody. You know, just a, a, a surprise gift in the mail. And they read letter after letter after letter like this. And all God is to Peter Popoff is a cosmic candy man. Yeah, he's just, he's an ATM. But of course, Popoff doesn't believe this. Popoff believes that the people in the congregation are the ATM for him. But he is telling all these people, and you can't believe these people sitting in the congregation. He gets up and he starts saying these things, and they got their hands up, and there's tears running down their face. I'm going to get my breakthrough. And I think, boy, have they been completely you know what misled. They remind me of Revelation. Oh, yeah. Harden their hearts. Yeah. They don't want the truth. They don't want the truth. They couldn't care what <laughs> this book experience. says. All they, they want, want their experience. That's right. And you know what? Unless people are willing to say, and if you went into that congregation, you told those people, the Bible doesn't teach what this man is saying. Let's have a, a Bible study. None of them would come. That's right. None of them. They because they don't, they don't want, want that. And that, that is the depravity of the human heart. That's but if you're right. flipping through the channels and you see this guy with nice cut hair and he's sitting down and he he's, looks really handsome, his name is Peter Popoff, How watch him for now? probably 50 or 60. I don't know, 60, 65, I guess. Yeah. But yeah. if you see him, stop and just watch. You will never get past five seconds without him bringing in money, ever. It's all money. All, but he does it in such he's a slick... He's not the only one. Oh I, know, oh, I know. I'm just saying that this guy has been exposed and people still go to him. It, it, terrible. Just unbelievable. So, go ahead, Jay. Okay, this is what we ended up. Instead, you brought us into this wilderness to make this whole assembly die of hunger. Like, yeah, Moses is, he's a bad guy. <laughs> then the Lord said to Moses, I am going to rain bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. This way I will test them to see whether or not they will follow my instructions. Okay, so he is now saying, I'm going to give manna, and I'm going to give it just enough for each day. And 
I want to just, I, I, I'm testing them, okay? Testing is masa, okay? So you have, uh, no, is that Mara, Masa, Meribah? Okay, yeah, we're going to get there. Um, anyway, he is testing them to see if they are going to be obedient. They have asked for food. They have had a difficult time. They have asked for food, and he says, I'm going to give it, all right? He healed the waters. They have water. Now, then they moved on from there, but they know that he is in control of the water. Now he's going to give them something they've never had before, all right? And this is a developing process like us in our Christian walk. Yeah. How much can you handle? How much yeah. are you going to observe? How much are you going to obey? And yeah. as uh, Jesus himself, you know, uh, he who knows to do right and does it not um, yeah, will receive many blows, but he who doesn't, these people are learning what they should do to do right. He is develop, developing them, just like us in Bible Learning study. Obedience through suffering. Oh, yeah. Yeah. As Jesus did. That's right. That's right. Okay, go ahead. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather on other days. Okay, so he's telling them the Sabbath is, there's going to be nothing. Let's go ahead and keep reading and then we'll talk about it. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, this evening you will know that if was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Okay, so you see what they're saying is that they're talking to Moses and they're saying they, they complained against Moses and Aaron, verse uh, 2. They are blaming Moses and Aaron. And he's saying, listen, I didn't bring you out here. It was the Lord. You should have figured that out by now. Okay, they've had all these demonstrations, but of course, yeah. you, you get myopic very quickly in life. And so... When you suffer. Uh, when you suffer. That's right. So he's saying... Pay attention, we're going to do some things here. we got all kinds of things coming up, but go ahead, Jay. You will know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. In the morning, you will see the Lord's glory because he has heard your complaints about him. <laughs> For who are we that you complain about us? So Moses just re redirects it entirely. He says, you're not complaining against us. It's the Lord you're complaining about. You have complained about him. All right, same thing in any church. You don't like the sermon and it was properly analyzed. Don't complain about me. Go to the Word, yeah. right? If somebody was in there that was a member of, let's see, who did I get yesterday? Arminius and Wesley, which is a church of God and Methodism. If they didn't like that, take it up with God. If I said what is properly aligned with the Bible, right. don't complain against me. But, you know, I did see one lady get up about 15 minutes in after I mentioned Arminius and Wesley in the Church of God. She got up and walked out. I don't know if maybe she had to get to work right. or maybe she just left because of the sermon. You never know. But she did leave and I didn't see anybody else leave because I was busy doing the sermon. But I did see that and I thought if she is upset about anything I've said in the past five minutes, she has to take it up with the Lord or prove where I am wrong. This is her choice. So, uh, hello, Diane. How are you? Um, we are in the book of Joshua, chapter 17. No, okay, not really. Um, 16. Yeah, 16, Exodus 16, 7. Go ahead. Eight. 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 <laughs> Moses continued, The Lord will give you meat to eat this evening and abundant bread in the morning. For he has heard the complaints that you are raising against him. Who are we? Your complaints are not against us, but against the Lord. He repeats it. It is not us that you are complaining against. And as I said, when I say a sermon, if it is properly aligned with the Bible, don't complain against me. Complain against the Bible. And just take it up with him. And I had a girl, I, maybe I mentioned in this class, if I did shut me up, is the one that um, I do the daily devotional and she said, I, I don't want to receive your daily devotional anymore, which all she has to do is click on like. It's not an email, it's, it's on Facebook. And rather than just clicking on like, she has to tell the world that I don't like the way that, and I said, I went back, it was Jude. We've been doing Jude in the daily devotionals. And Jude is not a book of happy things. No, he, that guy got down on I mean, he, and I said, tell me, t yeah, and I said, w you know, what have I done wrong? I mean, I'm just analyzing. She says, I don't like the content. It's not you, it's the content. And I said, well, then you take it up with the Lord. So she was, she was really, really sincere about it. She, you know, she just says, I don't like the content of these devotionals. Okay? Yeah. You know, and I, I got it to her from her after the second post or something that she just doesn't like hearing about that. Well, I can't help you. I, I can't because I started with Romans 1.1 1, 1, and I had to eventually get to Jude, you know, 13, 14, yeah. wherever he really got hammering these people. Mm -hmm. I can't skip over it, you know. Love it and 
Oh, that's right. And I, 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 I even quoted where Paul writes to Timothy, Timothy, and he says we need to take in the whole counsel of God. I said for me to skip over that would mean that I'm not being the Bible teacher that I'm supposed to be. That's why so, people don't read the Bible, and that's why. Oh yeah, don't they the they Bible. just want to do this, they and don't you know, hear it. my dad said nothing about that sermon yesterday. Was that nothing. your dad? Yeah. Sitting? Sh dark hair, short on the the side over so there. He, close to your mom. Was he close to you? Yes. He no, said I not a he word. He probably chewed nails. He probably was chewing nails over that sermon. He yeah, walked by my house. I was observing him. What's that? I was observing him, thinking perhaps it was your dad. Yeah, okay. And he was partaking in... He listens he very carefully. He well, does. And he was singing when we were singing. And I'm I, thinking, yeah. is that Charlie's dad? Yeah, it could be. He's, you know, but he... He's not a believer, is he? He thinks he is. He attends the Episcopal Church where they have homosexual visitors and, you know. Exactly. But he, he started there and it degraded. And what I think, this is a guess. I, I, he's my first prayer every night as far as salvation. Sure. But here's my guess. My guess is that my father is saved and he has forgotten. He's 2 Peter 1 9. He who is uh, these things has forgotten that he was cleansed from his past sins. Because as the Episcopal Church is degraded, yeah. he's just gone down with them. Slowly. Yeah. Yes. And it slowly and insidiously. Yes. So, but my guess is reading something that he typed years ago. I have hope that he's saved, but if he is, he has completely forgotten that. He does the Course on Miracles and all of these New Age things with, you know, yeah. but he walked by the house and never stopped and knocked on the door and said, you know, let's talk about your nothing, which means that he probably was very unhappy. But all I did was quote other people and give an analysis of it. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't like anything directed at him. But and you didn't mention the Episcopal Church. No, I didn't, but I mentioned the Catholic Church. And see, his wife, oh, his yeah. daughter is a Catholic theologian and she she's a Mary worshiper she's you know all of this crazy Your stuff no. no his wife's daughter sister. they're divorced oh yeah 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 his wife's daughter is okay. she's been the Catholic seminary and she believes all this Mary crazy stuff and That's you know just sister. the what She's yeah, but she doesn't talk to me. She knows I believe in the Bible, and I, I don't hold to Catholicism, but she holds to the infallibility of the Pope and all that. And anyway, that yesterday's sermon, I don't think that he liked it at all. You know, the content. He just doesn't like to have the mirror put in front Does of his face. Does he always come when you preach? Every time. Yeah. And there, the last time I mentioned anything with Catholicism, it wasn't anything really bad, but he said, you ought to leave the other denominations out. How do you no. do that? No. How do you show error unless you show where the error exactly comes from? Right. You, you can't do it. That's the problem. That's right. But that's what we're talking about is that you need to... Okay, let's, let's go on. Okay, Jay? Why, uh, those are the reasons why we hear pastors talking on unity all the time. But we can't have unity until people get their opinions out. That's, that's right. Bible. That's yeah. right. That's exactly That's right. right. Now, in this class... In this class, we give a lot of opinions. Well, yes, she is. But I got to tell you, in this class, we give a lot of opinions. But if they get too divergent, then we pull them back in. But I like opinions in here because I want to hear what people think, where they're wrong, where I'm wrong. And we can work that out. In a sermon, you can't go giving opinions. You have to give the Bible, and then you can give other people's quotes. This person, Martin Luther. Man, he's a great theologian. He did a lot of great things they for Christ. Right. Oh, when he talked about James, James has nothing of the nature of the gospel about it. His words. That man needs to be called into account. I don't care if he's been dead for 1500, 500 years. He, well, oh, yeah. and you know what? He wasn't always. I know he wasn't always. Okay. Yeah. Oh, you, you said at the end. Did you say? Okay. Yeah. What happened with Luther? And I, I want everybody to understand what happened with Luther, Luther as far as I understand this. Martin Luther evangelized the Jews. He wanted them to understand who Jesus Christ was. He, he talked to them about it. He debated them with it. And eventually he came to the point that he said, you know, these people are really out. They are, and why would he do that? It's because he has desperately tried to get yes. them to understand the message of Jesus Christ and they've rejected it. But he failed to understand God's plan where blindness in part has come to the uh, uh, to the Jews so that he didn't understand it and had he understood it the dispensation of grace would have been coming to an end much sooner because he would have said oh 
This is the reason, and all of a sudden that doctrine would have started to bloom, but it wasn't until the time of John Darby and other people. God purposely blinded those people, including Martin Luther. So when people accuse Luther, like John Hagee does, Martin Luther was killed the day after he said this bad thing about the Jews. Well, he said a lot of bad things about the Jews, and he didn't die that time or that time or that time. Yeah. To equate yeah. this with this is stupid. God was not ready to reveal that the Jews have a part in and the world camping? ahead. What about this camping? Insane. If that, if that was true, then why wasn't, you know, camping said this right. over and over again. Why hasn't God killed him? Right. That one I don't understand. Right. You know, but God allows us to make our own choices. He lets us go in our own direction. But God in his sovereign decision, did not yet release the fact that the Jews really do have a place in society. And I don't know if you noticed, uh, some of you might not have been, and I don't remember who was here and who wasn't here yesterday, but we talked a lot about the Jews in Revelation, the class, mm -hmm. okay? And I was very excited in the class. Did you notice that yesterday? I was a little more excited than normal. It's because my dad was in this class. And I want him to understand that concept because he is, and I didn't do any of the, the, the stuff about, I didn't do anything negative about Catholicism or anything. But I, I spoke adamantly and firmly about the Jewish position because he is still in the Reformed thinking. Right. And that's without ever looking at him. I just looked at other people and pretended like this is a normal class. But I did that for his benefit because the, either this is true or it's not. Amen. Either this is the word of God or it's not. And he needs to process that on his own. But for him, you know, one time we had a disagreement in this house and he really said something bad about the Jews. And later he apologized. So he knew he was wrong. Or he knew that he had personally offended me because I support Israel. But, you know, yesterday's class, whether he knew it or not, was directed at him. It really was because I want him to understand that he, he's not to come to Charlie Garrett, his son, and say, you know, well, it's bad what the Jews are doing in Palestine. No. And I have given a pre-advance notification that what he tells me is wrong. That's why I did that. I would have done it anyway. I just wouldn't have been as animated as I was. Oh, I, yesterday was my favorite class in months. And not because he was here, but just simply because of the content and because I could, it just happened to be the perfect verses for us to go over with him in here. There are other... The whole room was listening to you and agreeing. Couldn't that's, he, that's right. Couldn't he feel it? Uh, that's what I'm hoping. Uh, that's what I'm hoping. Is because the class was all in agreement, everybody was yes, yes, I hope he could feel that. That's right. So anyway, and you know, I love my dad, but he, I, either he is saved or he, and he's completely mm -hmm. turned away from that or whatever. But you know, he just, he's got his own things. And you know, because he's married to Anne, who's a very sweet lady, he's known her since he was 13 years old, and his daughter is into this Catholicism very heavily, he doesn't want any animosity in the house. He'd rather throw his animosity on his son, which we all do. I'm not, no anger there. When I have trouble, I don't take it out on the Sunday school class, but when I get home, poor Hidako gets it. You know, and it's not intentional. It's just you, 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 you vent somewhere. So uh, anyway, and then I always, I always come back and I let Hidako know she's the best wife in the world. And she understands because you've got, and I'm not saying this, in any way other than Pick it's a big job. well no it, that's not what I'm saying what I'm saying is that I have three classes a week right here and then some and a, a sermon every week at the beach okay in that context there are a lot of people that we have disagreements with sometimes in this class more on Saturday night people at the beach that get up and leave from time to time that aren't a member of the normal group. They just come, like we had a guy there for probably 40 minutes last night, and after, or maybe not that long, maybe 20 minutes, but eventually he walked away. But it causes tension in your life, and I don't want to bring my tension out on anybody in this class. And so I'm withholding things that sometimes I, I would normally just lash out. Somebody disagrees with me, and I know they're wrong, You've got to be patient. Or somebody that just wants to talk and talk and talk, like I'm doing all the time, sorry. But somebody will talk about something that isn't biblical. They'll just bring up a point and they'll, and I don't want to have other people affected by that, so I have to rein it in at some point, but I want them to be able to talk long enough where they feel that they're getting whatever is in them out of them. That causes me, I gotta tell you, a lot of stress by the end of the week. Every week, I, I, it, when I leave, 
church on Sunday, which was really the end of the week for me, I'm burned out completely. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, and I don't mean kick the dog in that sense, but it has to go somewhere. You know, it's hard not to, you know, every person in here I'm sure has really disagreed with me on something at one point or another. You, I see it on faces and that causes me stress. Whether you say it or not, I know it. I perceive it. And I, I, I love the people that come here. I love the, the classes we're in. It's stressful because you don't want people to be unhappy, but you have to hold a certain decorum in a class or in a, yeah. a sermon. Wow. Uh, it, it, wow, I know why pastors last. The average pastor in America lasts less than five years, and then he goes back into whatever he was in before. And they, I think they said six. It, this is going to sound crazy, but I think the, the, it, it's 600 pastors a week that drop out. 600 a week that drop out. Some of them come back later. But think of that. If there's 50,000 churches in America, that means that a, a portion of them every week is leaving. 600 a week in America that just drop out. And like I say, some of them just do what this guy did. He's got a new church now. Okay? But that is a completely new environment. If I was in a church and things were really stressful and I moved to a new church, I'd have five years of, of fun. Right? Isn't that right? Mm -hmm. But after five years, man, you've been worn out. People come in. They complain. They leave. You know, people are bitter. So either you're going to move to a new church or you're going to go back to your old business. But it's hard for how few pastors stay 30, 40 years not many. They are the exception by far. And I know why. And I don't even have a church. I mean, I just do this stuff, right? Yeah, it, you know what? Those, those preachers that are preaching the prosperity gospel. Oh, yeah. Well, that's different. All that, it is different. That's right. Because they're saying exactly what the people want. That's to right. Do. So they don't get any they get conflict. Happy. That's right. And the only people that point at them are the people that they couldn't care about that's anyway. What it is. That's it's right. Damn. Yeah. That's right. So that, that, that's, they couldn't care. You know, if I write an analysis about Joel Olstein, he's never going to read it. And if he does, he's going to say, well, that doesn't matter because I've got the money. I've got 30,000 people. So it doesn't make any difference to him. Right? It's the people that are really following the word of God that poor pastors, man, they get eaten alive. They get eaten alive. Just like Jeremiah and Isaiah. Oh, yeah. All of those prophets. Oh, yeah. You people know, don't want to hear it. No, they don't. And, Nothing's changed. And it's always... Always the pastor's fault. That's right. Always. Yep. You know, that's just the way it is. So these, I, I understand now why they go through this. And, you know, if, whatever, there we go. Okay, I don't know how we keep getting off on all these things. But the what? What does that say for you, Charlie? Uh, well, I don't have a church, so I, it's just class and it's something out on the beach. So I ought to be happy with everything I got. But I do get stressed when I see people aren't happy. And I think... Anytime somebody That's doesn't... It's your job to make us happy. Well, I know. But th that doesn't change the fact that I get the stress. It doesn't change anything. Right. Oh, I know it is. I know it is. You know? But you know, it just... It, it doesn't make it easier saying that it's not your problem. Yeah. Yeah. Then Moses told Aaron. What? Yeah. I only do one class a week. Yeah. But I can tell you... When you're sharing the Word of God and you're not making people happy, you're looked at just like what you said Sunday. It's your fault. You're mm -hmm. saying something you shouldn't. Yeah. And you're going to take them off. And you cannot keep people happy. You no. Have to no. Keep God happy. That's right. it. But you can do that. Even, and so it's going to affect, it, affect us. So. That's right. You can say, you can say you, it's your problem. It's, Charlie, it, 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 I got to tell you, it, 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 it's the human condition. When you have animosity, unless you're a stone, it, it affects you. That's, I mean, that's, and every one of them affects me. And that's because I am passionate about this. I, I wouldn't be here if I didn't love to do this. I, I, absolutely, yes. I want to say the other side of the coin is, there's a lot of times, like, I know that my face will show that I'm not happy about something. It's probably because I'm having a talk with God. In my oh, life. that's right. You're convicted in your own soul. Yeah, yeah. It's not so it's for not you. Even, I'm looking at you. It's, I'm looking like, crap, God, I don't want to deal with this. I don't want to hear this. I, I know my mom's mean. the same. Yeah. She looks like she's mad. And I ask her, why are you mad? She goes, I'm not mad at all. Yeah, it's no. just, it's it's your own conflict with your creator. I understand. Boy, that's a real good, two good points from this girl in one day. I, I'm telling you, got my hair up with that one because we, we face those conflicts personally. And I can usually tell when it's something like that with an individual. When I say something and it causes somebody to scowl at me, they think, oh, you know, and that, you know, that's just because they, the people that know the Bible better than 
you know, the, the average person in a class are the ones that are going to start having disagreements because, yes? I don't even like you. Oh, good. Oh, gosh. It's tough, isn't it? Life is not easy. No, it's not. Uh, it isn't easy. Jay, where, you're, you're in control here, baby. <laughs> then Moses told Aaron, Say to the entire Israelite community, Come before the Lord, for he has heard your complaints. As Aaron was speaking to the entire Israelite community, they turned toward the wilderness, and there in a cloud, the Lord's glory appeared. So the, he's saying to the whole community, we're going to get this dealt with, not by me, but by the Lord. And the glory of the Lord comes out in the cloud. You know, the same cloud that they've seen, it's not like any sudden different thing. They know this, but you, like say, you forget. It's like me in Romans 8, 28. I know it's true, but unless I remind myself all day, every day, I forget. And I have to say to myself, I said it yesterday, I have to say 50 times a day, Lord, you are directing my steps. If I don't say that, my whole day, I was, oh, I'm miserable. He's directing my steps. I said it three times, I'll bet, before I came to this class this morning. Just out of my own little, you know, go ahead. The Lord spoke to Moses. I have heard the complaints of the Israelites. Tell them, at twilight you will eat meat, and in the morning you will eat bread until you are full. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. Once again, he's saying this is going to happen, and then it will happen. Okay? Is what, uh, uh, the manna is, I'm sorry, there's no explanation for that, but the, the quail. Suppose a whole flock of quail comes into a congregation, right? Just suppose it. Is that a miracle? It could happen anytime, anywhere in the world. But the Lord said in advance, you are going to have meat tonight. And it's going to be quail. I know I got it a little ahead of you. The manna, I'm sorry. Manna is one of those miracles. There is, I, I, if I've said this again, I'm sorry, but there is a Discovery or History Channel show I saw where they said, oh, we know what the manna of heaven is. And there's this like stuff that shows up on these little, there, there's a couple bushes out in, in the middle of the desert and it gets this stuff on it. And they said, this is certainly the manna, right? And first of all, there is, as far as the eye can see, Nothing. There's a couple bushes out there. And this stuff gets onto these things and it's white in color and you can lick it to keep you alive. Is that enough to feed 603,550 no. people so plus? No, way of knowing. no, but even, even if it kind of matched the description in the Bible, right? Suppose it did. Is it enough to feed a million and a half people? No. The answer is no. There's a couple bushes of this. The what? What they're talking about. Could you scoop it into baskets? You know, I don't think so. I remember seeing it and thinking, you know, all I thought is, I wouldn't care if that is the stuff. Suppose it is. But one, it didn't come all over the ground and everything the way it says in the Bible. But secondly, I mean, it wasn't enough to feed a, a, a three-year-old. Suppose you can lick this stuff off or whatever it was. But you're right. I mean, you know, people will say, we have to give an analysis of this and we've got to prove what it is so that the Bible can't support itself. Well, in fact, if they just simply read the account, it's not possible. But I can't remember if they could scoop it off of there or if it's just something you, you know, whatever it was. It wasn't what we're going to see here. Okay, go ahead. Okay, 13. 13. So the evening, so at evening, quail came and covered the camp. In the morning, there was a layer of dew all around the camp. See, this is a layer of dew, and it's all over. It's not on just certain bushes. It's all over. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. When the layer of dew evaporated, there on the desert surface were fine flakes, as fine as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they asked one another, What is it? Because they didn't know what it was. <laughs> Moses told them, It is the bread the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Gather as much of it as each person needs to eat. You may take two quarts per individual, according to the number of people, people each of you has in his tent. So the Israelites did this. Some gathered a lot, some a little. When they measured it by quarts, the person who gathered a lot had no surplus, surplus, and the person who gathered a little 
Okay, so here we've got a few things to talk about. I'm looking for the uh, particular thing, and it's in John 5, 6, 7, 8, somewhere around there where he says, I am the bread of life. Um, if, if you have the reference to that, let me know because um, uh, I, it's right here. Let's see, John 6, John 5. It's right here somewhere where um, my father is working. Try 631. Okay, let's see. I, I know it's right in that area. Let's see here, 631, he says... Um, uh, here it is. Okay. Uh, Therefore they said to him, what sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe that you work? This verse 630. Um, the, uh, believe you. What work will you do? Our fathers ate the manna in the desert as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. This is what he's talking about here. The bread from heaven. Then Jesus said to them, most assuredly I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. First, he says, it wasn't Moses in the first place. It was my father who did it. But he is saying, my father gives you the true bread from heaven. Not only did he give you this, but he's giving you something else. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to him, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. So right here, this shows you that the water and the bread in the wilderness only pictured Christ. It, that's all it is. It's a picture of Jesus Christ. He is the bread of life. And he says it again somewhere down here. I'm the bread, uh, here it is, 51, um, uh, 48. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the man in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread I shall give, him, uh, shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. And then you go down a few more verses and the people get angry. They don't like what they heard. And some of them depart. And he says, are you all going to depart? And he says, yeah. But he is saying that all of this only pictures him. And then there's one more thing in this vas uh, passage. Let me go back. Where, what, what verse were we reading, Jay? Um, where were we? We started... Uh, 17, 18. 17, 18. Okay, I'm on the wrong page here. 14, 18. Uh, 18. Through 18. Yeah, okay. 18. Both you and the people... Uh, no. Where? 17? Oh. 17. 16. 18. They measured by the court. 15 through 18. We're ready for 19. Eight, but what chapter? Oh, 16. Oh, 16. So everybody's, okay, gotcha. Six, oh, so here we are, 18th. And then what he says here, this is the thing which the Lord has commanded. Everyone is to gather according to each one's need. So he's telling him, you take this much, an omer for each person, okay? And he is specifically telling them what to get. Uh, uh, according to the number of persons, let every man take those who are in his tent. Then the children of Israel did so and gathered some more, some less, okay? So some people got a little greedy, some people were a little lazy, whatever, okay? But when they measured it all up by weight, what? Some people want a lot of Jesus, and some people want Maybe that's a it. little but, bit. Right, maybe, yeah, okay. But Paul makes the comparison in the New Testament. He says, uh, let me see, it's uh, 1 Corinthians 10 is where I have a, uh, a thing. Let me see if that's what I'm looking for. Paul uses this example. He says... Um, uh, one, now what, where am I doing? 1 Corinthians 10, that's, oh, 2 Corinthians 8, that's probably what I'm looking for. Paul uses this as a spiritual example in, uh, let's see here, 2 Corinthians 8, what did I say, 15? Uh, let's see here. Uh, for I, okay, let's go back a little bit to 10. And I give this advice. It is to your advantage not only to be doing what you began and were desiring to do it a year ago, but now you also must complete the doing of it. This is when people had made a promise to support the uh, people in Jerusalem, and now he's holding them to account on it. He says, um, uh, so there must be a completion out of what you have. For if there is first a willing mind... It is accepted according to what one has done and not according to what he does not have. For I do not mean that others should be eased and you burdened, but an equality. And this is not socialism that he's preaching here. He's simply saying that these people have promised something. Other people at this time can't afford it. Okay, That now at this time your abundance may supply their lack that their abundance may also supply your lack, meaning at some point in the future that there may be equality. As it is written, and then he goes back to the account we just read, he who gathered much had nothing left over, and he who gathered li little had no lack. 
but thanks be to God who puts the same earnest care for you into the heart of Titus. And he goes on from there. But Paul is making an application about giving in the churches, about your ability. Right now there are people in the church that have got a lot, and there are people that don't have a lot. But in the end, the church has to keep going. All right. So right now this person can give and someday maybe the Lord's going to take everything away from him and somebody else will step in and fill his shoes. The Lord is going to fill the vacancy and people need to understand that their station in life is where the Lord has directed them. That, you know, that's all there is to it. But these people went in. That wasn't a bad point that you had there. Some people want a lot of Jesus and some people want a little. At the time, they didn't know who Jesus was. So, it was, right. you know, so in my opinion, right. it was probably laziness and greediness because they see this bread and they're hungry and they're like, whoa, I'm going to eat it. But yes. I'm thinking this stuff is like flakes. Yes. How many hours it would take to scrape up enough? Yeah, and I, I thought the same day. thing. Yeah. The heat of the day, and it disappeared. It so disappeared, they so they had, to, to do it. they had to get out there, and they had to do it. And, you know, you don't want to pick up the dust and the dirt. I mean, they're picking it up, and whatever it was, it's, it's amazing to see. It, you know, this is, this is one of those miracles. I'm sorry, you're not going to find a naturalistic explanation. And you know me, I love to find a naturalistic explanation other than the fact that God directed it with that. This one is just something that is... The unprecedented, yeah. absolutely. Okay, so go ahead, Jay. Each gathered as much as he needed to eat. Moses said to them, no one is to let any of it remain until morning. Okay, now this is where the Lord tests them. Remember, he says, I'm going to test these people. The first test is pick an omer for each person. And they didn't really obey because some people gather more than omer and some people didn't get, gather an omer. And so, but in the end, they had enough, okay, but that was part of the test. The second test is that you are not to let any of it stay over until morning. Go ahead. But they didn't listen to it. Okay. They, 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 we didn't even have to hear what happened. He just says, of course, they didn't listen. Some people left part of it until morning, and it bred worms and smell. Therefore, Moses was angry with them. Okay, so here they go. They're told not to do something. Okay, how would Moses know that they didn't do it unless they came out and said, this is garbage. It's got worms and it stinks, right? So not only did they not obey, but they were stupid enough to admit that they didn't obey. Moses is like, hello, you know, I, I told you not to. I, 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 can you see the irony in all this? It would be like, let me think of a parallel in this church. Somebody says, um, you know, don't do this thing. They do it anyway. Oh, how about a child? Don't put your... Uh, your uh, screwdriver into the wall socket, right? And then they do, they get sapped, and then they go and say, Mommy, the wall socket bit me. It's like, yeah. I told you not to do it, you know? Adam and Eve. Yeah, Adam and Eve. The whole, yeah, everything about the human condition, you can apply this to work environments, you can apply it to church, you can apply it to your family. The whole thing smacks of, not only are we stupid, but then we go and admit our stupidity. It's like we can't keep our mouths shut about it. Moses is angry. They gathered it every morning. Each gathered as much as he needed to eat. But when the sun grew hot, it melted. On the sixth day, they gathered twice as much food. Because they were told to. Remember that? Four quarts apiece. And all the leaders of the community came and reported this to Moses. He told them, this is what the Lord has said. Tomorrow is the day of complete rest, the holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you want to bake and boil what you want to boil. Okay, what does that tell you right there? That What you just said. Bake what you want to bake, boil what you want to boil. What does that tell you? There's a, there's a lot there. Work ahead of the coming of the Sabbath. So it's okay, that's right. But uh, About the specific, what did you say? I didn't... You bake the bread and you boil the meat. Is that what no, you're uh, now he's talking about manna there. So it won't spoil. No, no, no. I still didn't hear you. They were preparing it. They weren't just eating it plain. They were okay. eating it and turning That's it into right. food. All right. But Give it a worm. <laughs> no. No, what I'm thinking of is that some things can only be baked. Some things can only be boiled. True. Right? Yeah. Manna was, in other words, it was, it was unique enough that you could do different things with yeah, it and you could prepare it differently. The Lord gave them something that wouldn't bore them, in other words. They could cook it. They could bake it. They could do this and that. And so, obviously, you could throw in spices if you're boiling. You could do different things. In other words, it wasn't something that... It, now, they're going to get tired of it anyway. 
You're going to see this in the future. But what I'm saying is the Lord was kind enough to give them something that they could prepare in different ways yeah. so that they would have a variety. That's what I was looking for, is that it's not just something, you know, here's your, your grits every day. For, do you want to, here's, here's a yeah. good example of this. Do you know what they used to feed the prisoners that lived in Maine? Lobster. What? Lobster. They fed them lobster. And do you know that they revolted? And so they, they passed a law where the prisoners could only be served lobster. I, I, either they got a day off, a week off from it, or they got six days off and they had to eat it one day, whatever. The point is that they revolted because, you know, that to us is a dream. Yeah. Lobster, you know, but think it through. Obviously, there's a point where you get sick of lobster. You know, the Lord gave them the ability to prepare this in other ways. That's what comes to my mind. I wasn't trying to trick anybody. I just wanted to see if you thought the way I did. So, anyway, go ahead. Boil what you want to boil, and everything left over set aside to be kept until morning. So they set it aside until morning as Moses commanded, and it didn't smell or have any maggots in it. Eat it today, Moses said, because today is the Sabbath to the Lord. Today you won't find any in the field. For six days you may gather it, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath, there will be none. Okay, not only is it a miracle that the manna comes, poor Diane's dying back there. Not only is it a, uh, you look at, um, uh, but it's, it's more of a miracle because it shows up six days a week but it doesn't show up seventh day a week. If it was that bush that we were talking about, it would yeah. be there all the time, yeah. right? Yeah. It just would show up when it shows up. Yeah. So this is more than just the regular miracle. This is God divinely intervening in the process of the manna coming down, okay? The whole thing, everything about this is just so amazing to me because this isn't something you can explain away. Like I said, we have the answer with the Red Sea. The fact that it happened at a certain time makes it a miracle. But with this, this is just something we, we, we can't come up any explanation for. Well, why do we presume we can? We don't know the answer for why we have an atmosphere, why we have air, why we continue to float around in this space. Oh, that's right. I mean, we take things that are beyond us for granted. For granted. And then we try to explain global warming. Yeah, uh, ex so, that's right. Well, you know what? I'm going to talk about that one at the beach this next week. There's something called the anthropic principle. Have you ever heard of that? The anthropic principle is that everything, and I'm not just talking about earth and the, the water and how water floats and all these things, everything. Every star in the very, very, very distant universe, everything was designed for one reason. Mm -hmm. Anthropic, anthropos, man. As a matter of fact, the term is expected guests. Everything was prepared for us. Everything. There is no other reason for it. The universe is so finely tuned that if those way, 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 way out there galaxies didn't exist, we wouldn't exist. That's how perfectly, precisely tuned the universe is. We say, oh, that's a galaxy 15 zillion light years away. That would never affect us. It would affect us completely. Everything is tuned perfectly. Everything. Everything. There is nothing that isn't. So that's what I'll be talking about. And unfortunately, Pat's going to be eating chili instead. So I'm going to miss you. But uh, <laughs> Sergio is going to record it and he'll put it on my Yes, he will. Yes, he will. But uh, anyway, that, uh, uh, I, can't, I can't come to the chili thing because a lot of people says, well, you know, let's take a week off from church on the beach. Well, I, I can't do it because I have people that don't attend Grace that are out there. You know, and that is, some of them make it their church. That is actually the only place they ever go to is Rick, the guy with the motorcycle. I, I don't understand why the, comes, the guy comes out. You know, he's very quiet. He's never said, like, good sermon or I learned something. Nothing. But he is there faithfully every single week. He's missed, I think, one. Maybe No, he's missed two sermons. But how can I say, I'd rather have chili? I mean, in my heart, I mean that literally. I said to myself this morning, Lord, if Rick is the only person out there, I will preach to Rick because it, it seems important to him. It, and it means a lot to me that it's important to him. And not because it's me preaching, but because he is hearing the word of God. He grew up in Catholicism. 
And he said, man, I grew up, all I, I, he said, all I remember is the guy's 80 years old and he was so boring that I, I just, I, you know, that was his word for him. So how can I not be out there? I didn't know him in school. I mean, we went to school together, but he was two years behind me. I've met him one time, I think, before him coming out to the beach. And I didn't invite him. I just posted on Facebook, church on the beach, and he started coming. So, in other words, this means something to him. And so, I can't go saying, I'm going to have chili. Sorry, you know, can't do it. <laughs> if it's one person, then mom better be there. Anyway, <laughs> whatever. Um, so, where are we? Um, 27. 27. Please go ahead. Yeah. On the seventh day, some of the people went out to gather, but they did not find it. <laughs> Disobedience. This is the third time they've been disobedient over one thing. Go ahead. Then the Lord said to Moses, How long will you refuse to keep my commands and instructions? Understand that the Lord has given you the Sabbath. Therefore, on the sixth day, he will give you two days' worth of bread. And he's already explained this. It's like, hello? Okay, before I go on, something just popped into my head. And I wasn't saying you will be eating chili or you'll be at the beach. All I know is she said that to me. So you guys do what you want. I don't, you know me, I don't invite people directly. I only put it out over the airwaves if you want to come, come. Because if I feel like if I invite somebody other than my mother, now they feel obligated. And I never want somebody to feel obligated to come to this class or to come to the beach or anywhere else. And I think all of you know that. I've never say, well, why weren't you in class last Monday? I, that's not my thing. Not yet. Ever. Yeah. So <laughs> anyway, so that's, she just told me, I'm not going to be there. I'll be eating chili. I said, good job. Hey, man, they need to be honored. And I will let them know that. And I tried to yesterday, but I will let them know that again. Their service is greatly appreciated. I can't be there yes. for it. So, okay, go ahead. Sorry about that, Jay. It just came into my mind, and I wasn't trying to disregard anybody else. But Therefore, on the sixth day, he will give you two days' worth of bread. Yes. Each of you stay where you are. No one is to leave his place on the seventh day. Absolutely firm. You know what? This isn't like the Sabbath that we, we have a, even later. You know, they could walk a Sabbath day's journey. Remember that time? Many times in the gospel it says they went a Sabbath day's journey. That means that the apostles and Jesus walked from Bethphage, or how do you pronounce that in English? I don't even know how. It's a, a, a Bethany and Bethphage. You know what I'm talking about? Anyway, they're two little towns side by side. They could walk from there to Jerusalem. It was 1,000 meters or something. I mean, it wasn't a big deal. But this is much different than the Sabbath that even Jesus was was observing. Okay, these people were told not to leave their house. You stay inside completely and entirely. So, go ahead. So, the people rested on the seventh day. Good job, people. That's a good place Finally. to stop. Okay, yeah, let's stop there because, yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm glad you remembered. I'm looking, but I'm not really paying attention. And, uh, and, uh, Good. That was somebody marked that, please. It's wherever. I can't even see it now that my glasses are off. But uh, uh, and let me, uh, yeah, let me turn this off. Thank you for watching.